is not able to join. And I always say that we're recording this. So if you get that message, it's not like, what? What? It's kind of like you're at a, a police interview, you know, and they're recording you. But we are recording this for everybody that registered and wanted to attend, but maybe couldn't. And then also for you, if you want to go back and watch it again, like I do on many of the things that we do. So it's kind of on demand, like everything that you see today. So we're recording this. We are, are grateful that you all attended. I know that you are going to appreciate uh, Jerry's um, insight, his humor, um, transparency, so many different things. Um, this year's Mental Health Awareness Week, when I was looking at and preparing for this, has a theme of what I wish I had known. And it's really focusing on the, the power of lived experience and it was perfect because I'd already talked to Jerry about doing this, what, months ago. We were talking about this in early spring. And then I thought, how perfect, what I wish I had known. And I think he's going to give us a little bit of a glimpse into that on self-care, mental health awareness, and how in the midst of the ALS journey, those things, self-care and mental health awareness are equally as important. So I am going to hush. I am going to turn it over to Jerry, and I just want to again say thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks very much, everybody. Uh, my name is Jerry Cook, and um, professionally, I teach sociology at Texas Tech University, and I am also recently retired as a Presbyterian minister. I've held that hat for 40 years and my professor hat for about 30. And uh, putting on my preacher hat for just a second, I have a text from which all of this is going to start not a biblical text, it's actually a story from uh, the prologue to the novel Gates of the Forest by Elie Wiesel. He's a Nobel Prize winner and a Holocaust survivor. And he tells this story. When the great rabbi Israel the Baal Shem Tov saw misfortune threatening the Jews, it was his custom to go to a certain part of the forest to meditate. There he would light a fire, say a special prayer, and the miracle would be accomplished in misfortune averted. Much later, it fell to Rabbi Israel of Bryson to overcome misfortune. Sitting in his armchair, head in his hands, he spoke to God. I'm unable to light the fire, and I don't know the prayer. I can't even find the place in the forest. All I can do is tell the story, and this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient. For God made man, God made woman, God made us, because God loves stories. So that's why I became a storyteller. And uh, in order to be a storyteller, you have to have story listeners. So I'm delighted that you're here, and thank you for being my story listeners. I think that telling stories and hearing stories and living stories are kind of a fitness regimen, a daily workout for mental health, just like physical exercise strengthens our bodies, I think stories strengthen our minds and maybe even help keep us well. So here's my story, briefly. Once upon a time, a wonderful woman and I got married. We were best friends for 15 years and married for 21, and then we weren't, which was a mental health crisis for sure. And um, I sort of came out of a three-year cave of COVID and caregiving and was at the grocery store for the first time just a few days uh, after, after. And um, it suddenly hit me as I was putting my credit card into the thing to pay that I was, I was still wearing this wedding ring. And um, I'm not suggesting anybody should think about this in any way different or in any way like me, but it brought me up short. One, it made me just incredibly sad because it hit me that I was no longer married. And um, I thought about just keeping it on there because it felt like I was when I looked at it, you know. But one of Jeannie's constitutive traits was that she was viscerally incapable of lying. She could not look in you in the eye and, and lie to you. She could shade the truth if, if it meant it would be kind, but she couldn't lie. And it occurred to me that if I wear a wedding ring, it's in a sense telling the world that I'm married and I'm not. So I thought about that for a little bit. And then I was also listening to her a little bit in my ear where she said, you have to learn to cope with this. And uh, wearing the wedding ring might, 
might might circumvent that a little bit. So uh, I, I I thought about it for about three weeks and then I took it off. And um, in part because of that story, I think Tanya, that was one of the first stories I told you. I decided to try to do something with it. And in this presentation, I'm going to use that to uh, to show in some way, kind of an object lesson, how love moves us forward. First, I want to tell you about Jeannie, because it would help, I think, help you understand some of the stories and gives a broader context. She was in any and all ways a teacher, whether she was teaching professionally, which she did in California and Illinois and Iowa, or just teaching by example with her kids or at church or in many other places. She always could be one to whom you could look to learn something. And I've said many times that any time you were in the room with her, you felt a little more emotionally safe. And that's what she wanted the world to be for her and for other people. Her superpower was picking up kids who were strays, the kids who were ticking or had a short fuse, you know. And um, she made a deal with the, with the principal and the teachers that if there was a kid who uh, went off, as it were, and this is when she became an elementary guidance counselor. This, is, this was part of her deal there too. She was a teacher and a counselor. She made a deal with the teachers that if a kid went off, send them down to her before to the office for punishment. And she would try to sort it out a little bit. And one of the tricks that she had, she had a laundry basket full of bricks, styrofoam bricks actually, painted up to look like real ones. And if a kid came in with a full boil, she'd just set them in front of the laundry basket and they could throw bricks at a target on the wall and just kind of air it out. And once that became known, sometimes kids would come down there preemptively and they would say, I'm about to, I'm about to go nuts. I need to throw some bricks. So there was this sort of pro, you know, this sort of restorative and preventive strategy here. And what she would find out more often than not is that the kids weren't as angry really as they were afraid or as they felt helpless. And her superpower was to take that rage and expose it for what it was and accept it for what it was. A great deal of fear and a great deal of helplessness. And, um, and that was just one of the ways that I think that I think kids were the better for being known her a little bit. Um, kind of interestingly, she had a good relationship with the school psychologist and they kept in touch over many years. And every once in a while, Frank would send her uh, something in the mail, a newspaper clipping or an email or something about one of these kids, one of these ticking kids that had wound up in jail. And Frank would chide her a little bit and say, here's another one you didn't save, you know? And they would both laugh, but the point is Jeannie didn't try to save them. She tried to give them what they needed to save themselves. Her work didn't depend on the outcome. Her energy for her own work didn't depend on the outcome. Sort of reminds me of the New Testament parable of the sower. And I've heard a lot of sermons about that, most of which sort of say, you know, be that good soil where the, where the seed can take root. But I think the better, you know, the more interesting point of the story to me is the reckless abandon of the sower. The sower, the God figure, if you will, is just throwing seed everywhere. And the sower knows that it's going to land on thorns and on rocky ground and on the path and God knows where else. But every once in a while, something's going to bloom. In Texas, she came to Texas uh, when she married me and um, decided not to get recertified. Instead, she found a place in a church basement across the street from an elementary school in a pretty crummy part of town that was essentially a whole room full of strays. And so she volunteered in an after school reading program for 15 years, sowing more seeds than doing it for free. So I think there are hundreds, maybe thousands of kids who are better off because her primary strategy was to teach them coping skills. She even called herself the great adjuster. And the ones that wound up in jail, well, I think maybe, maybe they would have gotten there earlier and spent more time there, but for her love. So that's just her background. And I will tell you that she never, never stopped teaching, even up to the very end. When we were on hospice care, the, a medical thing happened, and, uh, and I thought the hospice doc ought to have a look at it. And so um, I suggested that. I said, well, let me get the doc in here. And Jeannie started blinking with the eye gaze, and, uh, and she said, no. She doesn't know ALS. Now, here's who the hospice doc was. This is a very young woman. We started calling her the kid because she looked like she was about to enter senior year, if you know what I mean. Uh, but she was board certified in family practice and was doing a residency and a fellowship in palliative medicine <clears throat> under the tutelage of one of the attending physicians in family practice at University Medical Center here in town. 
But anyway, she was the doc. And Jeannie said she didn't know ALS. And in fact, she was right, because most of us don't know all that much about it. Even, even the best in the world are still stumped. But anyway, I said, I went into full tilt obsessive caregiver mode, if you know what that's like. And I said, no problem, because the kid's supervisor was supervised by my primary care doc. My doc happens to be chief of family practice at UMC. We're friends. I have his cell. So I'm into this obsessive mode and I say, that's no problem. I'll text Ron, we'll get the varsity in here right now. And then Jeannie started blinking again. And this is what she said. She said, she said, no, no, she needs to learn. So ever the teacher, right? Now, when I heard her say that, oddly enough, something else occurred to me. If, uh, if you're at all familiar with Christian worship, there's, there are moments where we celebrate Holy Communion, Sacrament of the Altar, and so on. And when the elements of communion are shared, the recipient hears these words. And these are the words I heard when Jeannie said, no, she needs to learn. In other words, this is my body given for you, which sort of blew me away because all caregivers are blessed to be able to tend to this soul and this body. And I think that's true for doctors and nurses or anybody else that has the honor of caring for someone and being cared for in return. This is my body. So that's Jeannie. She was, um, she was my best friend when I set my life on fire. I wanna show you a picture. This picture, was, this picture is about 30 years old. It's one of my favorites. It's a school picture. And uh, I had this on my desk, well, until I brought it here to show you. Um, she helped me find the ground again when I set my life on fire. I was jumping around in the flames and she, she set me on a new path that was sort of ironically uh, a movement toward the life we wound up sharing as more than friends, as it were. So we were a team, ultimately. She helped me find solid ground again and I gave her some wings. I learned early on in our friendship that one of her fantasies, if you will, a lifelong dream that she never really expected to have happen was to attend the Wimbledon tennis tournament. She was a lifelong tennis player, big tennis fan, and Wimbledon is holy ground for anyone that plays tennis. And, um, you know, I just took that in and um, I thought, well, maybe, maybe not. And then, oh, 15 or so years ago, a little bit more than that, um, I found that there's a tour company that specializes in making that dream come true. And, um, you know, they're, they're well paid for it. But in any case, it was possible, right? It wasn't impossible. So I showed her that. And she said, uh, we talked about it a little bit. And her mom had recently had a medical event. And my parents were getting kind of weak and flaky. And she said, well, you know, maybe that'll work out someday. But let's let this, let's let this parent thing play out, as it were. Well, and then two of my dear colleagues at Texas Tech were lost in the span of a year to um, brain and pancreatic cancer. So I grabbed that brochure again after we lost the second one and I said, look, nuts to it, let's go. So we broke open the piggy bank and stretched a credit card a little bit and we went. And it was everything we could have imagined. Uh, Wimbledon is just amazing and we saw great tennis and so on. But also as a part of the tour package, we were able to see a musical on uh, London's West End Theater District. So we got an email as to what musical we could get tickets for. And the second one on the list is where Jeannie said, stop, that's where we're going. We were gonna go see Wicked. Now I didn't know much about Wicked, but it's, um, it's sort of the rest of the story to the Wizard of Oz. And the two main characters, Glinda, the Good Witch of the North and Elphaba, who's the Wicked Witch of the West, that actually this, the, movie, the movie doesn't tell the truth about what happened to her. But anyway, we're gonna go see Wicked. And uh, the, the play was amazing. And toward the end, right before the finale, these two main characters, Glinda and Alphaba, are on the stage and they sing a duet to a piano. And uh, it sort of recounts all the adventures and misadventures that they had. And it's called For Good. And they look each other in the eye and they say, because I knew you, because I knew you, and then together, because I knew you, I've been changed. I've been changed for good. And that's, I think, the essence of her superpower. Again, 
you felt better if you were in the room with her just because there was a change for good around her. And just minimally, it's a lot harder for me to lie because I've been changed for good. There was a time when my life was on fire. I was actually pretty good at that and less so now and less necessary now because she found that the truth of me was worth who I was and she loved me for who I was. And so I didn't have to lie so much. So that's in one sense how love moves us forward. And I want to use my wedding ring now. I decided to use it kind of like an object lesson in a children's sermon. This is my wedding ring. I don't know how much of it you can see, but it's very carefully designed. It's made of two separate pieces of precious metal, one gold, one platinum. And um, it's, there's a sort of a wave design to it as well. And we put that in there because we love the beach. We were actually married on Gulf Shores Beach and uh, spent vacation time there every year for decades. And just this last August, we put a small portion of her ashes, returned it to the sea, and um, she'll be there for us. But the point here, and I don't want to criticize the Bible too much, but it says when two people are married, two become one. And I don't think that that's wrong necessarily. I just think it's incomplete. What we tried to symbolize in this ring is that two actually become three. We remain who we are. But there's a third being that's created with its own separate life and heartbeat, really, that we called us. Just, we called it us. And uh, we sort of decided that when resources were short, whether it was money or time or energy, when resources were short, we would try to feed us first, you know, and just to put it sort of simply and, and in a sort of silly way, um, instead of buying a new baseball card, we bought something for the house, right? So we nested before we sort of poured more money down the rat hole that is my, my hobby of collecting baseball cards. But nonetheless, us is this third being in the relationship. And it occurred to me as I was, you know, as I took this wedding ring off, that us still lives because of who she found in me and brought me forward into a better version of me to, to be a part of this world that, that we still share. I still carry us forward. And the love that created us still moves us forward uh, on my watch. We were partners in every sense and throughout our life and our marriage. Um, humor was gold for us. Uh, we loved watching funny movies, had our favorite stand-up comics. I've dipped my toe in stand-up comedy once in a while. And um, she said, let's watch HBO instead. But nonetheless, um, there's nothing funny about ALS, <laughs> till there is. I wanna be delicate about this. We were tending to what I would call big business at the commode, fair enough. And in the middle of all that, she wanted to tell me something. And I don't know what she wanted to say, but I think she wanted me to put something somewhere because the first two letters of what she was trying to tell me were P-U, from the commode, P-U. Yeah, it took us a minute. And we laughed as long and as hard as we had in quite some time. And ever after, we started thinking about and talking and, and actually using the euphemism alphabet for big business on the commode, as in, well, time to take an alphabet break or got to go sing the alphabet, you know. And it uh, lended a little dignity where dignity is in very short supply, to put it that way. Gave us a little smile. And uh, I thought of, 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 of that uh, as alphabet ever since which does give me pause when I go to buy soup. But, um, but we were able to accept and tell the truth to each other about any and all things. And we were very lucky. Somehow or other, I decided I would accept the invitation to officiate at a wedding in a couple of weeks. This is gonna be the first wedding in several years and it's gonna be the first wedding, of course, since. And I was thinking about if, if you are ever in a situation where you're swimming in alphabet soup with somebody you love, you're gonna find out real quick whether you were telling the truth when you said at one point, for better or worse, in sickness and in health, or when in whatever way a partnership is sealed, you're gonna find out if you were telling the truth. She helped me keep my vows. Here's how. 
she was viscerally independent as well as incapable of telling a lie. And she would chide me from time to time when I would decide that I needed to get some help in figuring something out. She would say, well, you can really figure this out yourself. You're pretty smart and have had some experience and so on. As long as we weren't talking about plumbing or electricity. And then she would say, put that hammer down, get the phone, do deal with this. Those vows are sacred. And because she was so viscerally independent, I heard her say hers in kind of a new way. There's nothing that ALS does more prominently than strip you of independence and autonomy. And in a sense, when she allowed me to take care of her, she enabled me to keep my vows by keeping hers. And she said, in effect, I will turn over my body to you. It was, I think, without question, the most loving thing she ever did and the hardest thing she ever did. And I'm just so grateful. I'm just so grateful that she thought I was worthy of that. So it's in that context, I think, that I want to talk about those wedding vows with my wedding ring a little bit. We put that in there for a reason. We put this sickness and in health part in there for a reason. We believe that love is stronger than sickness. Not so much necessarily that love cures sickness because it doesn't or takes it away because it doesn't, but it does help us cope. So I wanna try to give you a little metaphor here with, um, with actually a parlor trick. One of the reasons that I sometimes do lie is that one of my hobbies is an amateur magician and magicians have to lie to make a living. But anyway, do a little parlor trick and, and use it as a metaphor. This is just a rubber band that's in everybody's junk drawer and I've got it around my, my first two fingers here. And I'm gonna stick another one behind it. And I want you maybe to think back to when you were a kid and you got sent to your room because of something you did and you were told, go, you go to your room and think about that, okay? And so you're in your room like this and you feel like you're sort of trapped, but you're not, the door's not locked, it'd be a fire hazard. But when you're in your room as a kid, you're also surrounded by all of those things that are the trappings of love. You've got furniture, you've got blankets, you've got toys, stuffed animals, you've got Legos. Well, they're probably in a semi out in front of the house, but nonetheless, you're surrounded by the trappings of love. And that is where you can find a better version of yourself, as it were. You know, you go think about what you did. Well, no, go think about how much you loved and maybe things change. And what's interesting about this little parlor trick is that when you think and stretch and just blink, suddenly you're free. Let me show you that again. Trapped in here, right? Not trapped, you're surrounded by love. So you think and blink and stretch and suddenly you are out with a chance to be the much better version of who you are. Fair enough? Well, that works in a similar way with the wedding ring. You can take the rubber band. I'd rehearse this a little more. There wouldn't be such a fumble finger right here, but nonetheless, here we go. Okay, I've got the rubber band. I've got the ring on the rubber band. You can see that, right? Surrounded by love. When this rubber band was on my finger, I was literally, my whole body was surrounded by how much she loved me. So I've got the rubber band here and you can, you can hold it like that. So you can stretch, think and blink and suddenly out of all of that love, you're free to be a better version of who you are. I'll show you again. It's unbelievable really that, um, that something so powerful can show you so much. Just stretch, think, and a better version of yourself comes out of all of that love. In other words, that love moves us forward. And I'm gonna show you just how powerful that is. I'll show you one more little thing, and then we'll talk a little bit more. I'm gonna take another rubber band and I'm gonna break it. And I'm gonna make the claim that love is not only what helps us find a better version of ourselves? Love is actually the most powerful force in the universe. I'm gonna put that broken rubber band in my hand and put the ring on top of this tail. And I will say this at the outset, that if you're trying to find out how powerful love is, it works better if you start with something that's broken, 
or someone that's broken. So I'm just gonna pull a rubber band out of my hand. And of course the ring just goes like this. But when I pull it out of the rubber band or pull a rubber band out of my hand and begin to think about all of the love and how love moves us forward, the ring begins to defy gravity. Love in this ring goes forward, not only forward, but uphill against the force of gravity. Love is more powerful than the force that holds the universe together. And it holds us together. Love moves us forward. Well, I have one more story that kind of crystallizes it. And once again, it goes back to weddings. A couple months before we were married, I was invited to co-officiate a wedding. And by co-officiate, I learned it meant second chair in the corner of the room, but nonetheless. Um, it was a huge whiz-bang wedding in, uh, in Dallas. All the trimmings, all the ceremony, everything you could think of that goes into a wedding, this was it. And I had this small part because I was a friend of the groom's family and they wanted at least some representative from the other side of the, of the aisle. And so I got to read the prayer, that was my job. I could read the prayer after it was mostly over. And I didn't even get to write the prayer, but I got to read it, okay? Well, that changed my life in so many ways. I, um, I used that same prayer at our own wedding. I had that in our own wedding two months later. It's been in every wedding since, and it will be in the wedding that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And I just wanna, wanna read you portions of it. But imagine, imagine that this is a wedding and, um, and the officiant or the deeply second chair laugh afterthought officiant gets to read this. Eternal God, creator and preserver of all life, giver of all grace, look with favor upon your world and especially to pledging your love. May they be quick to minimize each other's weaknesses, swift to praise their points of strength, and so always be able to see each other through a lover's kind and patient eyes. Give them courage when they hurt each other. Give them the grace to seek your forgiveness and to forgive each other. Give them enough tears to keep them tender, enough hurts to keep them humble, enough success to make sure they always and to always stay together with you. And grant, O oh God, that at each day's end, they may be found as they are now, hand in hand, thanking you for each other. At each day's end, we held hands and caught each other's eye with thanks. We held hands and caught each other's eye every night through her last night. Even though we couldn't hold hands, we could look each other in the eye and live the truth that we were grateful. And I can still catch your eye, I think, when I look up at the brightest star. And I'm grateful for, for us and the love that continues to move us forward. So thank you for listening to my stories. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, since storytellers need story listeners, I'd be happy to listen to any of yours or for comment. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. And y'all feel free. We've got a small uh, live uh, group of attendees today. So you can turn off your microphone and you can share anything. How is love moving you forward today? Um, and you don't have to share, but again, it's a safe place if you want to, or if you want to put something in the chat, you can do that as well. We can see that and Jerry can see that too. Just ask me a question or just any comment is welcome or not. That's fine. Um, if, uh, if there's nothing, I do have a couple of other stories I've got that didn't fit into the set, but you know, however it goes, I'd be happy. I'd, I'd love to listen to anything any of you have to say if, if it's there. Hey, Jerry, this is Tim Talley. I'm on my phone and Rebecca and I have been listening and we are weeping as, um, uh, we listen to your stories. It was just very, very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And I'm, Me too, actually. I'm, I'm grateful that uh, I get to hear some of these stories in person. I'm very, very blessed. Thank you.
You know, my role as a minister um, put an interesting spin on this whole thing in a couple of different ways. Um, people would ask me, you know, does the fact that you've been kind of a professional in religion, do, does it help? And I said, well, sometimes, and sometimes not so much, really. To go way back, um, Jeannie, Jeannie beat stage three cancer a couple of years before ALS showed up. And the first symptom she had was that her speech was slurring. And then she lost her voice pretty fast after that. But because of the cancer, and they warned us that it wouldn't be unthinkable that it would come back, you know, and it might come back to the lung or the brain. I was just convinced that she had brain cancer. And, um, and, and I don't usually pray for outcomes. And that has, I've actually taught professionally, you know, don't pray for outcome, pray for the ability to deal with whatever the outcome is. But I went against my own advice and prayed for an outcome. I just said, I'm begging you, let this not be brain cancer. Now, maybe I should rephrase that because it wasn't <laughs> not exactly the answer to prayer. So for a good darn long time, my prayer life was sporadic and I, I would say just tacitly civil in my conversations with God. And, um, and this happened, it happened literally in the last week of her life. Um, by that time, transferring from chair to commode to bed and so on. I was still able to do that with just a gait belt because she didn't weigh very much and, and I, you know, we'd learned a few tricks. And um, I was transferring her from the, the power chair to the, to the toilet and the commode. In order to do that, I had to grab the gait belt and just kind of twist like this. It was sort of a one, two, three count, you know, lift, turn and, and drop or, you know, place. It was almost like the waltz and we'd had some, um, we'd had ballroom dance lessons uh, years back. So we were sort of aware of, of body awareness and all that. But it was a three count move. And what horrified the PT and OT people when I told them this is that I would lift up and turn and then let go of the gate belt for just a second while she was turning and I had the other hand and then go underneath the thigh and then bring her back and to sit square. So for just this one second, I had her one handed, right? And um, this one particular day, um, I missed the regrip. So now it's not a waltz, it's a tango, right? So in the span of about a half a second, I, you know, I grabbed whatever I could after I missed it and then just sort of pushed back as best I could and just un amazingly landed her square on the bullseye. Uh, and we kind of looked at each other and went, well, that was interesting because <laughs> it was tango time. And then suddenly it was over. And, and again, this was very, very near uh, 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 the end of her life. And after that got all settled, what hit me was this. And this, this is my way of circling back to, to the role of faith, if you will. It hit me, and I told her this in so many words, and, uh, and uh, I said that, you know, for just a second there, right about that time I missed the regrip, for just a second, it felt like I had a third hand. And in retrospect, I think that third hand was there all along, whether I was interested in being aware of it or talking about it or not. So, um, so I think even the strength of, of, uh, of the kind of help we get from our faith, even if it's not, you know, intentional, I think we get some of it. That third hand was kind of like foot in the sand, you know, the, the old story like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I am a doctor. I tell my students in sociology that I'm the kind of doctor that's not particularly helpful. I mean, what am I going to do if somebody vapor locks? Quick, form a group, right? <laughs> but I did learn something, and since this is Mental Health Week, uh, I learned something that's actually prescriptive from uh, one of Jeannie's ideological heroes. She was a psych major and then did the whole counseling thing and, and teaching thing. Uh, the late Albert Ellis is a Jewish psychologist, and he had a strategy for his people who were in the soup a bit soup in some way. And he called it mitzvah therapy. Now a mitzvah is just a Jewish term for, for an unrepayable kindness. And it's even better if it's done anonymously. It, the, the, you know, the metaphor or the, you know, the, the silly example is you plug an, uh, uh, plug an expired parking meter and just do it anonymously. 
And he said, um, if, you're, if you're depressed, if you're a little out of sorts, um, eat a Dove bar for energy and then go do a mitzvah. Well, it occurred to me that I spent three years soaking up mitzvahs from dear people. And there are angels among us through ALS Texas and through our local group here that, that just did for me an unrepayable kindness. So I had this soaked up storehouse of mitzvahs. So I don't even need dove bars. And a couple of weeks ago, I was sort of out of sorts and was in an odd place on the tech campus and had a chance to do a mitzvah. And the, the, you know, the story of it isn't really important. But what is important is that, um, that I was given the honor for someone else to soak up a mitzvah from me. So I would say you might try mitzvah therapy when you're depressed or in any other way, a little off center, eat a dove bar and go do something kind. Or just be aware that other people might allow you the honor of doing a mitzvah. Because here's the deal, folks. I've been filling the space in my life since, well, sometimes I call it she ascended, sometimes I call it she ended the fight or her life here ended. I've been able to fill the space with stuff like this. I've been working on this presentation for a year. I do some magic shows for kids and I took on an extra class at Tech and all of that fills the space, but nothing, nothing fills the void and nothing ever will, except for what you can place in it. You can place something in the void, not to fill it, but to just to place it in the void. And what that is, is I think a little more tolerance, a little more forgiveness, a little more patience. And I have found that that works. It helps me settle down a little bit if I can back off and find in her honor a little more patience, tolerance, humility, and forgiveness. And that occupies space in the void, and it's a way to give our life together, our almost 40 years of, of friendship and marriage, some honor. And it helps, again, that love to move us forward. So thank you again very, very much. Jerry, I know you and I have had uh, several conversations and I've seen the magic tricks and I still don't fully understand it, even on the screen. Um, and and y'all feel free. We still have time for you to share how love is moving you forward or anything that you want to ask Jerry. But I just want to tell you, I, I personally enjoyed today's presentation, today's stories and sitting, I've got my coffee here, but I felt like I was sitting with a dear friend, uh, with a professor, with a doctor that can help. Um, and so uh, for me, I, I found it um, probably gonna be the best uh, hour of my day. Thank you, Tanya, I appreciate that. It helps to know that in whatever stage of the fray we're in, there are people that that no, and you know we're in a pretty small and pretty crappy club actually, and uh, the the thing that helps is kinship and friendship, which is the basis of love. Mm -hmm. I I always say, and I I somebody told me this years ago, but I firmly believe it that we're better and stronger together. We weren't created to do anything alone, um, and especially. Uh, in our ALS Texas community, we definitely weren't meant to do it alone. No, we couldn't do it alone. Yeah. Anyone else have anything that you wanna share or ask? Well, it's a high honor that you became my story listeners. That's, that's for sure. Thank you again, Jerry. We love you. This was great. You bet, Tim. We'll see you soon. And Marshall said, thanks so much, Jerry. He put that in the chat. Ah, you bet. All right, Jerry. Thank you so much. Again, we have recorded today's uh, storytelling. I'm used to always saying presentation or workshop. Today was storytelling, and I love it. I think we need more of it. Uh, and I do want to add that Jerry is uh, next month already is uh, November. Uh, and in uh, recognition of National Family Caregivers Month, 
he is coming back to do a magic show for kids next month. So more magic. And kids is a very broad term. Remember that. We are all kids. Kids are in all ages. So you're welcome to join that. Let me see what is uh, in the chat here, too. Uh, Linda wanted to ask what church you attend. Uh, interestingly enough, I, that was something I put out. I was going to tell in that story. I uh, was the pastor of a church in post, uh, kind of a side hustle for 24 years. And then um, through COVID, we found uh, an online ministry, which interestingly enough, even in my whole, you know, I'm not much interested in talking to God phase, we worshiped together for the first time actually in my whole career as a professional clergyman, because I was always up front soaking up all the accolades and she'd be in the back, you know, sometimes sitting alone. And uh, it was especially hard for funerals. So this was the first time in the last year or so of her life that we were able to worship together. And uh, on the basis of that, that particular uh, church that's here in town, oh, First Methodist is what it is. Uh, they, were, they were kind enough, the minister was kind enough to conduct her memorial service. I, I called, we, we emailed back and forth, but had never met. And I called him, I said, I have, you, I have three questions. Are you willing to to do this, this uh, mitzvah for us, really, um, having not known us, he said, yeah. I said, are you willing to do pretty much what I tell you to do? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, will you keep it to 35 minutes? And he agreed. And it was so kind. Uh, and so I still, I still tune in to First Methodist's um, online uh, uh, virtual service every Sunday. I love that. And, and Linda also said that her grandson is a freshman at Texas Tech. Well, he should take introduction to sociology with the guy that's not going to be doing it for much longer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, somewhere between December and a year and a half from now is when I'm going to quit. <laughs> no, I've got, I've got this semester and three more probably, this, the end of this academic year. But yeah, just look me up. I'd love to have him in there. That's my, that's my specialty. Uh, is dealing with uh, with first year students, uh, and I've even got an honors version of that class. So put them wise, and that would be great. I'd love it. I love that, and I have to get out later this afternoon to pick up groceries. I'm going to add some uh, Dove bars to my list. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know, whatever it takes. <laughs> I love that. Uh, anyone else have anything before we end today's storytelling? And if Jerry will accept our invitation uh, to come back again another day, I feel like we'll have more storytelling. This has, has been really good. Oh, thank you so much for listening. All right. Thank you all for taking time out today um, to listen and to be story listeners, as Jerry said. Uh, we have recorded this uh, storytelling presentation, and as soon as we have the link downloaded and ready to go, we'll get that to you. It will be this week, okay, that we'll get that to you. And uh, thank you again for taking time out. And Jerry, thank you so much. It was good seeing you again. My honor. Thank you. Good day. All right. Goodbye, everybody.